Center for Spiritual Living Denver, everyone that's watching online, uh, I do find that uh, our in-person audience today is kind of directly proportional to the temperature outside. Uh, luckily, we're not in the negative numbers in the room, uh, but I can already see that our numbers online are strong today. That means there's a whole bunch of you out there staying warm and staying cozy at home with us, and we appreciate you tuning in. If you're watching it another time, thank you for that as well. Feel free to chat along, chime along, drop your comments in the comment box as we go. I was reflecting this morning. You may think this is a little strange, taking the temperature into account and the fact we're in the middle of the winter, but I was contemplating roller coasters this morning. Because sometimes life feels like a roller coaster. I think we could probably all have experienced that. There's anticipation, there's excitement to get started on something, and then there's a bit of suspense and then a whole bunch of where in the world am I, what's going on, which way is up, which way is down, which way is left, which way is right. And that's what's happening this week in the world of new thought, of metaphysics, of the science of mind and centers for spiritual living, if you will. Many of you know we are working with an annual theme called a brand rising. And what happens with an annual theme, much like Susan's song selection is, Things happen a long way in advance. So the basic outline for what we were going to talk about this morning, the basic outline for that was created a while back. And quotes were arranged and a team of really great people worked on this very, very diligently to bring forward an idea of a grand rising and using the title of It's a New Day. Now, I added the way it works in there, and Teresa spoke about the way it works a little bit in her opening reading, because traditionally in New Thought and, and specifically in the science of mind communities, we take the first four weeks of the year and we look at the first four chapters of the big, huge textbook, and we, and we study it and we learn it and we dig in because that has always been and I believe always shall be the basis of this philosophy, the science of mind. Now, one of the things Ernest did that I think was very, very intelligent is uh, he also recognized that the science of mind was not only a philosophy, but a faith and a way of life. It's really important that we keep that in mind because our way of life changes. I can't believe there's anybody in this room or watching online that is still living their way of life. Well, even that you were doing five years ago. And how many of us now have a drawer full of masks somewhere in our house? It wasn't there five years ago. But our way of life changes. And what's happening is the way we express and share this philosophy, this teaching, is changing as well. We're going to talk about that today. Because what we thought we wanted to discuss today changed this week. And I'm going to explain that. However, I want to start off with a couple of quotes by Ernest Holmes off of page 121 in the textbook. All illumination, inspiration, and realization must come through the self-knowing mind in order to manifest. If you and I are going to experience change in our lives, experience a new way of being, and dare I say a new society, it comes through our self-knowing mind. Teresa spoke about this in, in her reading as well. We have to be willing to use the practices and the principles on a daily basis if we expect to experience, if we would like to experience something different. One of my favorite authors, Michael Singer from The Untethered Soul, if you have never read The Untethered Soul, please get on Amazon right now, order yourself a copy. Uh, you're going to hear myself and I think you're going to hear some from Reverend Elzea throughout the year on uh, the Michael Singer work as well. He wrote, the natural ups and downs of life can either generate personal growth or create a personal uh, or create personal fears. Which of these dominates is completely dependent upon how we view change. Is change something scary in your life? 
Or is it something to be celebrated? And finally, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. See, what happened this week is there was a bit of controversy. And there was a bit of challenge for many. Some of you may have heard this along the way over the years, and this has been going on for a long, long time. This is how antiquated sometimes the communications are within the ministerial body of the Centers for Spiritual Living. And currently, if my uh, county, if my numbers are correct, there's about 800 or so licensed ministers in and around Centers for Spiritual Living. Now, that doesn't count the unity movement. That doesn't talk about divine science ministers. That doesn't talk about independent ministers or ministers that have been licensed by uh, or credentialed by other organizations. That's just the science of mind CSL ministers. And we have a, an email technology we call our list server. It's an old name for, for it. It's basically a, a, an email group. And we have all kinds of wonderful discussions and conversations and debates and sharing of resources. And what happened this week is a number of people had a number of different interpretations of the outline that was presented for us on the quotes that were given to us to talk about, to utilize in crafting our talk that today, in taking this concept of a grand rising and looking at how it works so we can work it in our lives. And wouldn't you know, it kind of threw my interpretation of this talk into a different angle as well. And I started to look at the conversation that was happening, and it basically boiled down into, two, into one of two ideas. As science of mind, as a center for spiritual living, is our work to do purely in consciousness? Is our Sunday service is purely to teach principle and talk about the, without talking about what's going on in the world? but just focus on the words and, and the philosophy of it and the faith of it. And then there are those that say, but what about the way of life? What about adding some action? What about making this real for the conditions and the experiences that are happening in our world? Some thought today's talk title or talk outline was too political. Others couldn't see how it was any, how it would be anywhere near political. And I love it because there's a conversation happening right now about taking those first four chapters of, of the science of mind and rewriting them. And rewriting them in a gender neutral language. But boy, don't ask us to uh, gender neutral the words of Dr. King, right? Sometimes I think not only organizationally, but individually, we find ourselves kind of pushed and pulled at, at, a, at a crossroads. Do I use gender specific language to maintain tradition or do I change that into non-gender language regardless of who the original author was who, who originally had the thought? Where do I let myself fall? Where do I fall on that continuum? And not only do we have to ask this of ourselves, but we have to ask this of our organizations. And not just science centers for spiritual living, not just the home office. But I, I know we have to ask this of each and every one of ourselves in our own individual communities. What is it that Center for Spiritual Living Denver is truly here to be? I could have easily taken the quotes given me. I could have easily piled on a few more Martin Luther King quotes. And we could have came in here today and stood around and, and talked about a grand rising of King's ideas. And, and truthfully, I don't know that that moves any of us. And more importantly, our organizational containers forward. 
I think in some ways, adhering to that old tradition holds us hostage, if you will, to an old way of being. A way of being that has led us to a place where most people, well, there's a lot of perspective out there that the world just ain't going right, is there? So much division, so much separation. It could be, I haven't, I didn't look this up, so I'll be honest, I didn't even think about it till just now. I wonder what the polls in America say right now around, are we going in the right direction or not? And somewhere along the line recently, I was introduced to this idea that if you look, if you really look at it, almost all of the great works, the, all the great transformational spiritual books uh, in one way or another start with the concept of in challenging times such as these. <laughs> Our dear friend Jim, Jim Lockhart, who's got a great blog wrote this this week, and not in relation to this conversation, but I think it fits. We're in the midst of a rapidly expanding atmosphere of fear, disinformation, climate emergency, political chaos, and mass in, massive shifts in what it means to be human. Are we not here to share this message so that humans can live the life we truly desire? He continues, this atmosphere is speeding up due to factors such as social media, artificial intelligence, and more importantly, a willingness to some of a, for some, by some, to use these tools unethically to further their own agendas. Excuse me, back to the next one. It can be a scary place out there. And I want to be straight up, if it's scary for me, a middle-aged white guy with every bit of privilege that you could ever imagine, if I can experience some of that, that division, that fear, I don't want to know what it's like for my LGBTQ brothers and sisters. I don't want to know what it's like for, for people of culture. For those that perhaps look at the world and dare I say, even look at politics differently than I do. I don't really want to have to know that, but I don't have that luxury. I can't take that privilege any longer. I have to be willing to answer, ask the harder questions of myself. And I believe, and I'm full wholehearted here, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, and I trust I'm pre preaching to some ministers that are going to watch this talk later this week. We have to do it differently. In that same conversation online this week, Reverend David Alexander shared some of this. And now normally what's on that list, sir, folks, is, uh, where are my slides going, are uh, highly confidential. And so in this case, I did ask for permission to share uh, what specifically what he wrote and his name. You'll notice I'm not sharing other names about this conversation. We would do well to remember that silence for the sake of peace is complicit violence, hiding behind privilege. If I don't step up, if I don't personally take a stand for my colleagues, if I don't personally take a stand for this philosophy, I am complicit in the violence that is happening in our world. To my LGBTQ and A brothers and sisters, to my brothers and sisters of color, to all those that may feel oppressed in any way, I am bound by this philosophy to take that step forward. David continued. I affirm that we are stronger every time we defend human dignity because it demonstrates our most basic principle, oneness with the divine. Oneness with the divine. Back in the 1990s, there was an experience within the what was then the United Church of Religious Science. Uh, we're going to play a little bit of the the, uh, the anacronym game for you. And if you lose me on any of the letters, don't worry about it. But in the old days, 
there was one organization, the Institute of Religious Science. And along the way in the 50s, there were some disagreements within the Institute about how to take this movement forward, how to, uh, how to, how to bring the concept and the teachings into everybody's lives and in the way it can be used in everyday life. And there was a, a division. There was a split in that belief. And what happened is we ended up with what was known as the United Church of Religious Science or UCRS. And there was another organization, they, their name, they chose Religious Science International or RSI. Now, these two organizations continue to operate throughout the years, sometimes bumping into each other, but for the most part, ignoring each other, even though we live in a world of oneness and teach a philosophy of oneness. And when I first stepped into this philosophy, into this community, into this idea of what this could all be way back in 2001, uh, my first teacher said, you know, I give it 10 years and it's all going to got to come back together sooner or later. How can we continue to teach oneness when we're obviously living separate lives organizationally? And he was right on. Almost to the almost to the, and by 2012, those two organizations had moved through a series of, of evolutions. They both became centers for spiritual living. At first, there was the United Centers for Spiritual Living, which held the UCRS moniker. And then there was the Religious Science International became the International Centers for Spiritual Living. And for a number of years, we operated side by side, parallel and mixing a little bit more. Think of it as a cocktail party. We'd show up and we'd say hi to each other. And some of people took some time to really get to know each other and each other's culture, because here's what happened, folks. There were two cultures operating simultaneously that suddenly got thrown together. That was 10 years ago now, 12 years ago now. In that was born the Church of, uh, excuse me, in that was born Centers for Spiritual Living. And along the way, all these various ministers and practitioners, we've all come to get to know each other. And what happened is, back in the 1990s, the United Church of Religious Science had a convention where there was a creation of an affirmation of same-sex marriage, equal rights for the LGBTQ community. However, there was an atmosphere of fear, if you will. And some people felt that if we took a stand for what we believed in, in this regard, that we would lose congregants, that people would leave the churches. There were people that made it known that was true. And in a very contentious convention, which I was did not attend, but in a very contentious convention, there was a lot of arguments and there were accusations and there were threats, not of physical violence, but there were threats of what might happen to someone's community if they voted for this, for this, and eventually, and it didn't pass and we voted it down. I have it on pretty good authority that one of the largest new thought communities in on the planet without naming names based somewhere out of Southern California, LA area, chose to leave the organization because of that decision. And I know of other smaller groups that felt ostracized, felt neglected, felt ignored, and walked away from the organization as well. See, we can't be silent ever again. We can't do it again. Continuing with what David was saying is, I accept that doing so, this acceptance, can be seen as division. That such perception is commonplace resistance to be expected when we are building new muscle. And I'm going to add when we are building a new society. The division is welcome and embraced because the principle of love dissolves every division. 
So while we argue whether we're being too political by talking about Martin Luther King and social action and what Martin might be doing today if he were still with us, and while we debate about whether we're here to just teach principle and only talk about what the words that are written in our, I loved how you used the word Bible today, Teresa, because it's not meant to be that, but so many people treat it that way. We have to be willing to reinterpret and reimagine the foundational philosophy that got us here and take that into a new millennium, into a new age, into creating a new society. I affirm that engagement in politics as people of faith is not about taking a side, not taking a stand for one, uh, but excuse me, not taking a so side, but taking a stand where one is called for. I stand for love, dignity, and greater compassion. The role of a prophetic voice in faith is not to be concerned with which side of the aisle it falls, left or right, but rather which side of humanity it lends a hand, the enfranchised or the disenfranchised. A courageous voice of oneness in today's divided landscape snatches from the jaws of political cannibalism those topics of human dignity and worth that belong on the altar of humanity, not the ballot box of politics. And for many churches, that ballot box of politics is directly proportional, they believe, to the money that's going to come in through their collection plates. And those days are done. From my perspective, those days are done. But there is good news. Let's go back to our friend Jim. We cannot be spiritual change agents if we turn away from the difficult topics and the fear associated with them. We are not more spiritual if we do not watch or read the news. What we are is less likely to creatively respond to the world's pain. And folks, that's what I truly believe is the future of this movement. How we respond to the world's pain, to the places where we see the world's pain as individuals and as a community. Excuse me, sorry about that. What is needed is each of us to realize our inner power to a greater degree and then act in unison to affect change for the good of our communities, our state or provinces and our nations. We must show up at every opportunity to be heard and to affect positive change. So the call today, if you will, is for you. If what I've just shared is too political for you, that's okay. Let Elzia know. <laughs> you might not see me as often. <laughs> or I might choose to change the way I deliver the message, but I don't believe my message would change. I'm not going to walk in here and tell you all it's all nothing but love and light. When there are people freezing literally freezing on the streets of Denver today because they are looking for the promise of the American dream. And we're saying, sorry, not if you come through that door. We must, I believe, make a change. And I believe that change is happening within our organizations as well. And there will continue to be arguments and there will continue to be conversations. But I encourage you to remember what Reverend Dr. David said. All those divisions are dissolved by the power of our love. You can attack the science of mind all you want. You can say it's junk philosophy. You can say that it's all made up. You can say that it's a con game. You can attack any of these individuals for their beliefs. And I'm not going to buy it. Too much love for this philosophy. This stuff changed my life. I know it's changed your lives. I know it's changed so many lives.
was a woman, and I'm embarrassed to say this, who provided and gave this new thought philosophy such a great gift. But I was sort of trained in a little bit more of a, let's call it a CSL centric environment. Because this woman never taught from within the Centers for Spiritual Living or the United Church or, or Religious Science, because she was never, quote, part of the religious science, because she came from a, a little bit of a different lineage and because she looked a little bit different than most people. We didn't teach about her. Reverend Dr. Johnny Coleman was a force and still is in Chicago, years after her transition. And in all the little quippy phrases I've heard over the years, treat and move your feet, all valid, don't get me wrong, all valid, not knocking any one of them, because if it supports you to remember how this works and that you can work it, then it's valuable. And she said it real clear. It works if you work it. That's it. Think about that. It works if you work it. King knew that. There have been people in this philosophy all along that have known that deep truth. But for some reason, because it came out of the mouth of a black woman, who was more associated with the unity movement than the religious science movement, we never heard about. It. I think the day is here, not just to hear those words, but to look at how do we enact those words. Because what the, this teaches us, the way it works, there is nothing that is impossible. Nothing. 12 years ago, we set about to create a, a world that works for everybody. I think that a more accurate description of that is a world that works for all, all life. That includes a little fish in my tank at home. Because I'll tell you, when I forget to feed my fish, they get real angry with me and they let me know. If we are creating a world that works for all life, and I believe we are. Well, you've all heard this. It starts with us. And then it moves into our communities and then it moves into our organizations. And along the line, what we are doing is we are creating a new society. I love your minister. Reverend LZ is a great friend, a great colleague. We do all kinds of great stuff together. And we've been having these conversations as well for quite a long time now. And I think what, if you listen deeply this year, not just to those that stand up and parrot what others are saying, but if we listen deeply to those that are bringing an, orig an original thought to the evolution of the New Thought Movement, there is nothing we can't accomplish. Creating a world that works for all life. I invite you on that journey with me. So how about a quick prayer? Before we completely run out of time and I take us way overboard, we can do that at another point. But for now, let's just take a moment to turn back with it. If you're in a safe and comfortable place to close your eyes, please do so. As we step into a recognition of our oneness into a recognition that there is truly only one, one source, one supply, one never-ending wellspring of love and light and beauty and truth, of health and the wealth and well-being and abundance of evolution and creation, one self-existent cause that is forever taking on form and abandoning that form in order to take on new form, one, one life. And that life is God's life, and that life is perfect, and that life is my life, your life, right now. In this moment and in every moment, I know you are a divine emanation of God's life. 
that each one hearing these words now or at another time in another dimension, each one a divine emanation of God's life, a divine unique collection of gifts and skills and talents that we each bring to this thing called life, a way of being, a way of living that no one else can bring, that no one else can be. I claim for each one to recognize and know that the power of the absolute resides within each one of us through our words, through our thoughts, through our beliefs. And that in some amazing way, we are collaboratively creating a world that works for all. In some amazing way, each one brings to this thing called life something magnificent. And so therefore, your life is absolutely vital, vital to the evolution of human consciousness, vital to the evolution, therefore, of what is happening on this planet, how we treat each other, how we take care of our planet, how we use our resources and preserve our resources, how we create a place where life flourishes where we are united in our understanding, even though we may not be united in our demonstration. The contrast is necessary and love dissolves the division. So we let go of any sense of right or wrong, left or right, red or blue or purple. We let go of all of that sense of separation to come to a deeper understanding that we are one. Deeply, we are one. And so I celebrate everyone I encounter. I celebrate and I lift up, I inspire and I promote everyone I encounter because everyone is a divine expression of the one. And everyone brings a unique gift to the party. In a place of absolute, absolute gratitude for, for this moment, for this community, for what we were becoming. And in that gratitude, I release the word into the law, knowing the law, the universal law of creation is already acting upon it and cannot return this word void. We release this word into that law and let it be. And if any of this has resonated in any way, I invite you to please join me in an affirmation of truth as we say together. And so it is. Amen. so I just